Hey guys, welcome to Horology Biology. Now on this channel, I like to restore vintage watches back to their former glory and get them running a lot better than they did when I first received them. On this episode, I have got the Seiko 8305-1010 Diashock watch. Now this is a really nice watch and it was actually sent in from one of the subscribers of the channel all the way from Canada, the other side of Earth. Now that's really far from where I am and it took a long time to come. Eventually I got it and I spoke with Kurt and we decided what we were going to do with this watch. This watch is going to get fully stripped down, it's going to get cleaned, pre-cleaned etc. And I'm actually going to do a full re-loom job on this watch as well because a lot of the loom plots were missing on the dial. And that's something that I've not shown before on the channel so it's going to be nice to see later on in the video how exactly I did that. So let's get on with the full strip down of this watch. Now first of all, as I always do, I remove the rotor from the back of the watch, held in with one screw. And the reason I do this is because I don't want to turn the watch upside down with a rotor on there because surprisingly they're actually quite delicate and the last thing I want to do is potentially damage it in any way. So it's always best to get rid of that first guys, completely highly recommended. Next what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the two movement holder screws in. These basically stop your watch from, well, your movement from rattling around inside the case because you don't want that. Nobody wants a rattly watch. That's not super fresh and it's certainly not how it should be done. It's not normal and it's not what you want. I'm then releasing the case from the watch, as you can clearly see, and then I basically will pop in the winding stem back into the watch so that I can adjust the hands because I'm going to need to remove these, of course, as well. So using a Presto tool and a piece of thick plastic just to protect this dial, because guys, I have to say it, this dial is in really, really nice condition. Now there's a lot of dust on there from where a lot of the loom has come away and it's basically filtered into the dial. It hasn't damaged it at all. I'm really, really happy about that because as you're going to see later on, the condition of this dial is really, really nice. A lot of the loom plots are missing, which is quite common on this movement. And I, as I said, I'm going to completely re-loom this later on. I'm going to remove all of the loom and I'm going to re-loom it in the way that I do it. And you guys are going to see that later on. So now that the movement is completely out of the watch, I got it on a movement holder and I'm basically going to tackle the dial side of the watch first. Now just removing this little bridge, which is holding the date wheel in place, held in with those three screws, as you can see. And then underneath, you can see everything else that we're going to tackle. So taking off the hour wheel, I'm inspecting things as I go along, guys. Also removing the cannon pinion as well with a cannon pinion remover. And it came off really straightforward. I'm not seeing no big buildup of rust. I'm not even seeing any big buildup of grime or anything like that. So considering that last Seiko that I worked on, which was just like dunked in WD-40 or a jar of oil or God knows what, this one is definitely looking like it's going to be a lot more of an easier challenge than that one. So removing the date wheel from the watch, and as you can see, it's quite a chunky one, uh, covering up a lot of room. Sometimes they're a lot thinner than that, but this one is pretty damn chunky. Also removing the date changing wheels and the intermediate wheel for this. And sometimes they can be a little bit slippy on your tweezers. So I really like these curved tweezers. I can't recommend them enough. Since I switched to using a curved tweezer set, I've not gone back, seriously. I like the way that you can turn them upside down and you just get so much more control over it and a better angle when you're trying to pick up pieces from your watch. It just makes things a lot easier in my opinion. And of course, I've always said this before as well, you've got to go with brass tweezers. I don't even use steel tweezers anymore, not for dismantling movements. It's just so much more gentler when working on the movement and you're minimizing any potential scratches that you can make. Can't recommend it enough, seriously. So just removing this little bridge, which is holding the automatic works in way. Uh, there goes a reversing wheel. Now it's a fixed piece, as you can see, and you can't dismantle that any more than what you can see. I'm also removing the click back here so that I can let the charge out of the watch. There was quite a bit of charge in there to say that it wasn't running very well, but as always, it's really safe and expected that you should remove all of your charge from the watch before you start going any further. So just taking off these little intermediate wheels for the automatic works, and then I found one which was a little bit strange. I have to say also, it's the first time I've worked on this movement before, so it's a learning curve for me. And I can see that this one has been held in with a C-clip and 
if I can get away with not removing it, I want to not remove it. Because it looks like somebody's already had a good go at that one, given the condition. So just removing the pallet fork bridge, held in with the two screws, and then I can just take that off to reveal the pallets underneath. Checking everything on as, as I go. And things are looking pretty good. So far I'm not seeing anything that's jumping out and scaring me apart from that uh, little wheel with the C-clip on top. Off goes the crown wheel core and then I can remove the crown wheel as well. And I can just continue with this breakdown. So I actually want to take this opportunity to welcome all of the new subscribers to the Horology Biology channel. I noticed over the last few weeks that this channel has really started to grow and a lot of new people have been jumping onto the HB train. And for that I'm really grateful. I must be doing something right. Super fresh. Mm. Of course not forgetting all of the original HB members to the channel, the Patreons of course, and of course the original HB subscribers as well. I really appreciate you guys. It definitely motivates me in regarding making new content. And I do have some really nice watches coming up as well, which I'm going to be making videos on in the future. So, of course, stay tuned and keep it fresh. So continuing with the strip down of this watch, and so far, things aren't looking too bad at all. Apart from that C-clip issue, I'm not seeing anything super negative, which is really nice. I've removed the screws for the train of wheels bridge, which is actually working as a barrel bridge as well. I mean, this thing is massive, guys. As you can clearly see, it's filling up virtually the entire size of the movement. Gently lifting that away and giving it a quick inspection underneath. And then of course it's going to reveal everything else. You've still got part of the auto works there. You've got the ratchet wheel, the mainspring barrel, and of course the train of wheels. Removing these, inspecting them as I go, just having a quick look at the pivots, and of course removing the rest of the components. Now I've touched on this before guys, and if you can inspect things as you go, you are going to save yourself time in the long run. It just makes your work for a lot easier, it works for me, and I definitely believe that it saves me time overall. Now of course the ratchet wheel, making sure that all the teeth are there, as they should be, and that it's not in a really bad state. And it's not, it actually looks pretty good. Off goes the mainspring barrel, which seems to be a little bit hard to get hold of as you can see. But it comes away, and I'm really happy to see that we're seeing jewels everywhere. Seriously, the more jewels the better in regards to this, as long as they're in their proper places of course. It just makes life a lot easier. So just removing this little friction spring. And this is a really, really little tiny screw. I actually put that screw back. Now here I lied into a problem. The C-clip has to come off because I do have to remove this wheel because that screw unfortunately is underneath and there's no way of unscrewing it. And given the amount of damage that I can see on this, somebody has had a really good pop at this before. And I'm a little bit concerned about that C-clip. It's not in the best conditions. So I'm going to basically look into that later on when I build this watch back up. So there's two screws holding down this little bridge. Just going to take those off, put those to one side, and then I can gently lift this off. And then we've got the center wheel underneath. Again, condition looking good. No big issues to report and I can remove the last wheel from the watch. Great to see as well that that's jeweled as well, just like the arbor is going to be jeweled. And again, it just makes things so much easier when you're building a watch. When it's metal on metal, you will encounter a lot of wear and that's where you can encounter a lot of shake and that's where you end up having to do a lot of adjusting. Of course, if it's jeweled, you're pretty much eliminating that issue because the jewels are very, very tough and they're not going to wear at all as much, for example, as like a steel. It's just not going to happen. So just removing this little cock, which is covering up this uh, quick set date changer. And I can just put these parts to one side. So how's everybody's week been? Man, my week has been actually pretty fresh. It was my birthday last week. It was okay. I didn't do that much. But at the weekend, I bought myself a gift, new toy. Basically, I drive to the gym and I have to pay $6.50 an hour for the parking. And man, over a month, man, it's, it's ridiculous, man. It's not normal. It's not super fresh. And unfortunately, it is what it is. So I've been looking into getting an e-bike for quite some time. I thought if I could buy something like that, then I don't have to pay the parking costs. So I did my research. I bought one. 
And man, this thing is nice. It's got big, super fat tires on it, which are mad fresh. And this thing is quick. It does 25 kilometers an hour, which is what you're supposed to do. But what I didn't realize was if I actually go into the settings on this thing, I can change it to go up to 45 kilometers an hour. Now I'm gonna be honest with you guys, that's too quick, man. So I'm cruising along at 35 and that's enough for me. I get there just as much time as it takes me with the car and it's mad cool. And the funny thing that I really like about it is it's got a digital like electric horn on it, which is, it sounds like a truck, seriously. When you've got these old people that are just hogging the bike lane, which is not fresh, I have to take advantage of that situation. So I'll bang on that horn. Man, you see them shake and vibrate and everything like they're having a stroke or something and they move out of the way. And I like that. It amuses me and it might sound a little bit mean, but you shouldn't be hogging those bike lanes in the first place. But it does actually make me chuckle, guys. It really, really does. But anyway, I'm really enjoying it and uh, I think it's definitely a good move and it's going to hopefully save me some money in the long run. So hope your week is going well as well, as well as it has been for me. So getting back to the watch before I've obviously been waffling on and I'm just doing the pre-cleaning. I mentioned this before, you've got to peg your jewels, guys. Peg them hard. It will save a lot of time in your cleaning machine and it's really important that you do pre-cleaning just as much as the full cleaning. I can't stress it enough. I've always gone on about it on the videos. It is so important. Please peg your jewels. So now that's done, I can put the balance back on so that everything gets loaded into the cleaning machine. Before that, obviously, I'm gonna break down the mainspring. I'm actually gonna put a new mainspring in this. Turned out that this one was kinked up and which can be quite common with these springs, unfortunately. Something to do with the way that they're set. Like I said, I'm not a Seiko guy, but I have encountered a few problems with Seiko mainsprings and uh, they're a little bit frustrating, to be honest. So I did get a new one for this and I think this watch actually deserves it. Now I bashed out the old crystal which obviously broke but it doesn't matter because it's getting replaced with a new one anyway. Now it's also important to note that this particular watch has a bezel ring that goes around and you need to be really careful when you remove this with a case knife because it's very very delicate. I'm also removing the old loom like I mentioned and first of all what I'm always doing is I'm testing the radiation levels. This watch was producing next to nothing so I'm good to go as far as I'm concerned. But even then I'm still doing this in water. I always do this and I always advise people to do this. When you're removing old loom which did have radiation tendencies please do it underwater. Now when it comes to the dial this was obviously a little bit difficult because I couldn't do it underwater so I basically was as careful as I can using Rodico to clean up the dust from the old loom and just gently going in with an old oiler to remove these loom plots. A lot of them were missing, so it didn't really take that long and it came off pretty easily. I also buffed up the indices as well, just to give them a little bit of an extra shine. So now that all of that pre-work is now done basically, I just need to basket prep everything, all of the parts ready for the cleaning machine. They're all getting put into their appropriate little baskets and I can load it into the cleaning machine and it's good to go. Also going to ultrasonic clean the case and the components connected to that. And then we're going to be ready for the rebuild later on. So this of course brings us to the relooming of the dial and the hands. Now I'm using a modern loom which is from Bergeon and you actually get three components. You get the lacquer, you get a thinner and of course you get the luminous compound which is obviously like a powder. I mix up the powder with the lacquer and the thinner is there if you've made it a little bit too thick. To be honest, I never use the thinner because I get my mix just right and just the way that I like it. And it's one of those things that just comes with practice. You mix it up in this little pot that you can see on the screen. And once you've got it to a good consistency, then you can go ahead and apply it to your hands. Now the loom on these hands is actually loomed on the bottom, so it actually makes things a little bit easier. You can be a little bit overzealous on this and go thicker because as it settles, it will get thinner. So you don't need to be too worried. Now for the dial, I actually did this laying on its side. I made sure that my loom was very thick, as you can see, so it would not run. And the reason I did this was because I wanted to do it all in one go. I've seen other people do this when they have the dial on the side. and Unfortunately, that is not something that works for me because I don't want to basically wait for everything to dry and then just start again because who says that you're going to have your consistency exactly the same. By making it thicker, as you can see, it basically will just gel into these little indice holes, these little plots 
absolutely perfectly. And I was really, really happy with the end results. It was like ice cream, like super whippy ice cream. Mmm, it actually looks pretty tasty. And the results of it in the dark, as you can see, look mad fresh. Really, really nice. So guys, if you've got this far into this video, you are doing well. And I super appreciate that. Please hit a like on this. It will certainly help this channel grow and it helps the YouTube algorithm do its magic. And of course, moving on now, we can actually rebuild this watch. Now, as I mentioned, I'm actually putting a brand new mainspring into this watch. And what you just saw me do was apply a chrono grease, which is a braking grease to the wall of the barrel. I can then go ahead and fit in the new mainspring. Now this mainspring, they're pretty hard to get actually, and this one came all the way from the US, which did actually take a bit of time to come. You basically lay it on in the right direction and then you can press it on with your tweezers and it will just snap into the case. It's actually easier doing this than using a mainspring winder with an existing spring. Uh, and that's how new mainsprings work. Uh, it just saves you a lot of time, a lot of effort. And you should always put a new mainspring into a watch when you've serviced it, if you don't know the history of the watch. It's definitely recommended, and I can't stress it enough. I mean, it's like uh, MLT on your car, you know? You have an oil change done, so get a new mainspring in there. Don't be cheap on that, get your new mainspring on. So once I put that in, I've also put the arbor in. I've added a little bit of 1300 to the side of the arbor, and then I can put the lid on for the barrel. And that just friction fits into place, as you can see that I'm doing right now. Pressing that on, it simply just clicks on and you're good to go. So now we can do the Dioshock Capstones oil in. I always do this after I've cleaned. Uh, they're like these little horseshoe flips, similar to the Inkoblox. I prefer the Inkoblox system on Swiss movements, if I'm honest, rather than these Dioshock settings. They're a little bit more fiddly. But like anything, you know, the more that you practice, the more you get used to it. So now that that's been removed, I can remove the capstones with a piece of Rodico and then I'm just giving a little bit of extra cleaning with some clean peg wood to the jewel. I'm also giving a little dip in one dip just to clean off any wood shavings and I'm also removing any of the old oil residue from the top of the capstone. I'm then going to put it into some fixer drop treatment which is going to clean it and at the same time it's also going to add a small film to the jewel so that when I oil it with some 9010 it's going to keep the oil in one place. Now as I've mentioned a million times before please add a drop of oil on there which covers around 70 to 80 percent of the circumference. You don't want to completely fill it. A decent amount as you can see on the screen is what you want. Once you've done that with your 9010, then you can put your top of the capstone back on and it will seal it all in place. And what you're looking for is a nice bubble of oil underneath that shines through, as you can see, if I can catch it, where your balance stuff is going to go. Simply pop that back on to your movement, put your dire shock setting back on. I just do this with my tweezers and a piece of pegwood just to hold it in place. And then that's it. You're good to go. Clean off any of that pegwood dust with some Rodico and then you're going to need to repeat the process for the other side. Now I've obviously speeded this up guys because you've seen me just do it on the top and the bottom is exactly the same principle. So once that's done I always test my balance just to see how it rotates and it was rotating pretty good. I mean you can see it's not even got any air on it and it was moving still a little bit which is great so it's very lubricated it's very free and that is what you want to see now that I've done that I can remove the balance completely uh, because we're not going to need it now until the end and you just want to basically turn that upside down so that the balance stuff doesn't have any stress on it and then just put that aside for later on so obviously we got that out of the way so I can build up the train now again and I've just put it in the center wheel on and then I'm going to put on this little jeweled bridge. That's held in with those two little screws. And then I can just screw those into place. I also add some 1300 lubrication onto this as well. And just make sure that you got your screws tight but not too tight. Little 1300 onto the post where this wheel is going to go. And this is the one with the C-clip which I had to remove. And as you can see, it's a little bit beaten up. So somebody's definitely had a good pop at this, unfortunately. And the C-clip was a little bit damaged. 
So I decided that I need to kind of straighten this. So using a staking set on a block, I'm just hammering this down just to make it more flat. And then with my tweezers as well, I'm carefully trying to make the hole a little bit tighter. So I'm just bending it a little bit just to make it a little bit tighter so that it clips into place when I put it back onto the post. It doesn't look pretty in my opinion, it's disappointing to see, but from a functionality aspect, that in my opinion is what's important and it does click back in a lot better than it did the first time that I tried to do it. Now whether or not I've got this the right way around, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that if I haven't, one of you guys is going to hit me up in the comments and let me know, rightfully so. So adding on this little friction spring, and that's held in with this really tiny screw, as you can see. Making sure that you line it up for the hole as well. And then I can set the rest of the build. Add in a little bit of 1300 as well onto this post. And then I can just slide it in. And it is the sweeper that will connect to the end of the pivot on that. Also add in a little bit of 1300 to the jewel where the bottom of the arbor is going to fit, which is obviously inside the mainspring barrel. Also giving it a little check to make sure that it's engaged. And then a little bit of 1300 as well to the top of the arbor. Oil as you go guys, it makes things a lot easier because obviously don't forget there's certain components that if you don't oil, you're not going to have access to it later on. So it is imperative that you oil as you go. Now this is a very strange looking wheel and I actually have no idea what it's called. No idea. But it's fixed, it's all in one piece and very alien looking. Super strange. But I'm not a big Seiko guy, seriously. Guys, if you want to watch Seiko watches in all their glory, you need to check out my friend Mike's channel at My Retro Watches. Now this guy is like a Seiko guru as far as I'm concerned. Man, super fresh with his Seikos. He always got Seikos on his channel and he's had his channel for quite some time. So I'll leave a link in the description to Mike's channel and you should also check out My Retro Watches if you haven't checked it out already. Really cool channel and full of Seiko knowledge. So building up the train of wheels, the second, the third, and of course uh, the escape wheel as well. Everything looking good making sure that everything is lined up and now I can add on this massive train of wheels bridge, stroke, barrel bridge. I mean, obviously, like you can see, it's all in one. And the funny thing is, when you first look at uh, bridges of this size, they can be a bit daunting because you think, oh man, it's massive. How am I going to line everything up? In my experience, the bigger they are, the actual easy they are to line things up. And I think it's actually to do with the weight of how heavy it is. So once again, with Seikos as well, they seem to love all of these little uh, extra shock settings on top of uh, train of wheels. Uh, I'm not a big fan of them purely because, you know, you have to spend a lot more time on them. You know, that's the only reason. I mean, I understand the functionality of it and they're definitely beneficial, but they do take a lot longer to actually oil. It's not just a case of just dabbing your oiler in there and going away. No, you will need to remove all of these. You will need to clean these little capstones. You'll need to oil them. I'm using 9010 on these two. And then you need to pop them back with their little clips. And they're a little fiddly. So I definitely recommend using some pegwood or a little piece of Rodico just to get it in there. And then you can just push them back into place. Now try to be careful not to damage the brass tops. I probably nipped these a little bit. Uh, unfortunately, it is how it is. So I'll hold my hands up to that. Uh, but I don't think they look too bad. 9010 on the second one as well. This one's for the escape wheel. And of course, repeat the same principle. And if memory serves as well, it's pretty much the same on the other side of the, of the movement as well. So you have to do the whole process again. So a little grease here as well. Really tiny amount that you want to put onto the wheel for where the cannon pinion is going to go. It needs lubrication, guys. I can't stress it enough. I see some people that don't lubricate that, and you really need to. Again, like I mentioned, it's exactly the same on the dial side. We have to remove these shock levers, and we have to clean these little stones, and we have to oil them with 9010, and then we have to reset them. And yeah, it takes a lot longer, and they seem to be very common with Seiko movements. So again, just uh, 
coaxing in the setting levers for these. And also afterwards as well, I've always stressed this, make sure that you use Rodico to your full potential and clean off any excess little wood shavings from your peg wood because they will be microscopic. But if your watch is clean, keep it clean. You know, it's just out of service, guys. So let's try and keep it that way. So I flipped the movement back over and now I can deal with the click. Strange looking click, as uh, I think. Held in with the one screw, very long click as well. A lot of Swiss watches, they will have a click and then they will have a click spring, whereas this, well, it's a click and a spring in one, basically. So I don't know what you want to call it. Is it a click spring? Let's call it a click spring, but it's just a, a self-contained unit, so to speak. So a little 1300 for where the crown wheel is going to go. So you've got two components to this. You've got the crown wheel, which is this part, and then you've got the crown wheel core, which is held in with the two screws. Now these are not reverse threaded screws. You pretty much only find reverse threaded screws when it's one screw and if it's in the middle. But when you use it, when it's actually used with two screws, they will just screw in in the normal fashion. Again, 1300 here for where the two components are going to meet. And I add just a tiny little drop on each side. And as it turns, it will just disperse the oil accordingly over time. So as I said, it's just held in with these two little screws. And then I just nip those up. Now, a lot of people ask me, how do you know that you're not over screwing things? Well, sometimes it can happen and you can break screws, but I think it's also something that you just naturally get a feel for. Um, I haven't broken a screw for a while, if I'm honest. And you just know not to tighten things up too much. It, it's just something that comes with practice and it's just, it's hard to explain, it just feels right, let's say. So I added a little fixer drop to the pallet forks and then I can add in the pallet fork bridge held in with those two screws, making sure that the pivot is aligned correctly because obviously you don't want to break that. And then I can just tighten those up with the screwdriver. And I flip the movement over again. This is a backwards and forwards movement, as you can see, guys. I'm backwards and forwards with this. I'm now going to be dealing with the winding pinion and the sliding pinion, adding a little bit of grease to it as well. And then I also add a little bit of grease on top of the sliding pinion for where the yoke is going to lay. And then I'll just pop in the winding stem with the crown attached. And then I can just leave that in place. So now I'll build up the keyless works. Little 1300 for where the setting lever is going to pop. It's not a screw. It is a push mechanism. Uh, I much prefer those ones. 1300 on the post, of course, where the yoke's going to lay. And then I can add a little bit of grease between the yoke and the setting lever. It's a metal on metal component, so it is important that you do that. Now, one thing to notice here, the yoke spring that I'm putting in, I got the springs mixed up between the yoke spring and the date changing spring. I completely got them the wrong way around. They look so similar. But by the time I got to change in the, uh, adding the spring for the date change, it just wouldn't fit correctly. And then I realized I must have mixed up these springs. So I had to go back and correct that. You don't see it in the video because it's a waste of time, but hey guys, I'm holding my hands up to this. And yeah, mistakes happen, man. It's, uh, it's a part of watchmaking and building things up. And like I said, I've not worked on this particular movement before, but the good thing is with experience is you, the, what I've found is that you recognize your mistakes faster rather than later, so to speak. So quick check of the keyless works now that the setting lever spring is in and everything's working accordingly. So now the movement flipped over again and I can oil these pallet stones. Just the tiniest little amount on the exit stone. And then I will nudge the pallet forks five times just so that it displaces the oil accordingly. And then I will repeat the process a few more times. It's in order so that every tooth of the escape wheel has a tiny little amount of oil onto it. 
What I also do as well, which you didn't see, I when I've done that, I remove my palette forks completely, I clean them again, and then I reinstall them. Now that the balance has been put on and the watch fires up, which is really awesome to see, because if it didn't fire up, this would be a crappy video. Wouldn't be fresh, no sir, would not. Adding some wine to the watch, and now I can continue on the automatic works. 1300 on the post for where this wheel is going to go, which is joining to the rest of the automatic works. Small driving wheel connecting to the ratchet wheel. And then I can put in this big um, reversing wheel. Now, I actually forgot to show this on the video, but it has had some Labetta treatment, which is a special oil for reversing wheels. I also do that for the rotors as well. You've seen it on my other videos that I've used these two components. You've got one for reversing wheels and you've got one for the rotor bearings. And when you oil it in those, you dip it in for 10 seconds, you leave it to set for 15 minutes to dry, and then you can install them into the watch. Adding on the bridge for the automatic works, that's also held in with two screws and you can see the jewels on top of it as well, which are going to get oiled. So I'm just holding it down with the peg wood because obviously I don't want anything to just misalign. I don't think it would with this, but I think it's just common practice that you get used to using peg wood a lot for supporting things. And yeah, why not? Better to be safe than sorry, guys, seriously, when it comes to watches. Parts are expensive, man, and you do not want to have unnecessary mistakes. So the movement flipped over and I can continue with the rest of the oiling. This is for the auto works that you saw underneath. I'm using a combination of 1300 and 9010. And now I can start to build up the calendar works. 1300 on the posts. And I can put in these date changing wheels which all connect up to the hour wheel. Again, 1300 for where the minute wheel is going to go. Quick set date, changing lever with that big star shaped cog on the end. That's basically for the uh, quick set date. So if you pull the crown out to the first position, you can actually change the date in both directions. Uh, you can go left or up or down, let's say, whichever way is quicker to get to the correct date that you need. Adding in the little spring and also added a little 1300 to that spring as well. And then I can put on this small little cock and that's held in with just that one screw. Again, using pegwood guys, it will make your life easier. I've touched on this before as well with Seiko movements. They seem to have so many of these extra little bridges and cocks that are just, they seem a little bit over-engineered to me, uh, very different to Swiss. So I'm just nudging back this uh, quick set date lever so I can add in a little bit of grease. And we're getting really close to the end of this. So this is just a little friction spring which lives on top of the setting lever. This is for when you push to release the crown or the winding stem and the friction spring obviously will make it bounce back into place and lock it into place. So I've added the date wheel and condition again. Really, really nice as you can see. Adding in the spring and then a little bit of oil as well for where the hour wheel is going to go. We're getting close to dialing up here. Really, really close. So on goes the hour wheel and then I can put on the uh, dial washer, just removing any little dust with some Rodico as well and making sure that all of the teeth are engaged correctly. On goes the dial washer. And then last but not least, we can put on this really big bridge, which is held in with the three screws, and that keeps the date wheel in place. As you can see, all of the teeth run underneath it really nicely. It just keeps everything snug. Just checking, of course, that everything engages with the, with the uh, date change as well. And I was getting good results with that both up and down directions, no drag, there was no resistance, no friction, and that's exactly what you want to see. 
So now obviously I can dial up the watch. I mentioned at the beginning you've got two screws on the sides of the movement which will nip up against the dial feed and just keep it in place. Look at those loom plots guys. Man they look mad fresh. Really really happy with how those came out. So I'm setting my date to 12 o'clock obviously because now we're going to fit the hands. Simple watch at the end of the day it's three hands you've got the hour hand the minute and the seconds hand. So first obviously you're going to put on your hour hand at 12 o'clock and then I'm using a Horotech hand press tool and then I can just basically nudge everything in place. Again here we got the minute hand on I'm lining that up and again back to the Horotech tool so that I can press it down. All of these hands are friction fit. I've never encountered hands in another way to be honest they're all friction fit. And then last but not least we can put on the seconds hand. Now this watch doesn't have a hack so obviously the seconds will just keep running so you do need to be careful when you're pressing this hand down. Now when you put your hands on make sure that your hands are not touching. That's not fresh. Hands touching will stop a watch so check as you're going along. So I ordered a new crystal it came and it's completely perfect for this watch it's correct and yeah there's a lot of dust on it I must admit but it's probably been in that packet for years probably longer than I've been alive fits onto the watch really nice I can simply just press that in it fits very snug could do it by hand which is really good and then of course you've got the crystal retainer ring which goes around the side of the crystal and this needs to be pressed on with a crystal press I'm just using my cheap press for this because the dies fit perfectly without touching the crystal and it just clicks in you'll hear a large click where it will just you know that it's engaged correctly quick blow off and it looks really good so we're getting towards the end now and of course I need to case up this watch so gently just lay in the case over the dial and already guys mm, man this watch is looking mad fresh seriously flipping it over and then of course I can deal with putting the winding stem in obviously I need to oil that first first in goes the movement holder now this will keep your movement secure inside your watch it's quite a beefy ring fits in just drops which is really nice and then I could add some grease to my winding stem and I'm also adding a little bit of mollycod grease as well to the gasket and then I'll just push that into the watch really simple really straightforward and we're getting to the end and I like it this is my favorite part guys my favorite favorite part so reversing our steps here so we've got the two clips and then there's a screw as well which will nip these in place and this is so your movement does not rattle in the case keeps everything secure and you've got one on each side. I found these a little bit fiddly so you had to align them as you go so I didn't fully tighten them up once I knew that the screws were in about 90% then I could just move the clip outwards a little bit so that it covered over the movement holder and then I know everything was good. So on goes the rotor it's all been freshly oiled and it ran very very free and I was really happy to see that as well actually. Held in with that one big screw and that's where we want to see a really nice loose flip so that it charges a lot easier. Also adding a new gasket as well to this case back just measuring it up and then I can find the right gasket which is going to fit. I also give it a little bit of grease. It's good to lubricate your gaskets when they're new. First of all it makes them more supple and it actually makes them easier to fit as well. Now rather than this going into the case it actually goes around the case back. I prefer those ones as well I find those a lot easier to fit and then I can put the case back on and guys we're getting so close to the end so I'm just nipping this up with a ball because obviously I will re regulate this watch properly in the next day or so but let's get the timographer results to see how it's going pre-regulation it's important to set the correct lift angle for this I've seen this before and some people don't do it and this watch is actually 53 degrees not the standard 52 and we've got it in coming at plus tall with an amplitude of 244 so the high 240s and I'm really happy with that. Seiko's run at a lower amplitude and to get 240s very very happy. 
So there we have it, guys. The Seiko 8305-1010. Mmm, that dial, man. It's not normal. It's super fresh and definitely how it should be done. If you still got your coffee on, there's another video on the screen right now that you can watch. And as always, guys, stay fresh. Till next time.